Hi, good evening. Um, we're going to get started. So the first thing I want to do is um, just a couple of reminders. We're going to have a quiz tomorrow. Um, at the beginning of the lecture today, we're going to spend about one hour to go over some new material. Then we're going to do a little bit of review. If you have any questions, um, if you don't have any questions, we're going to jump into the quiz directly. So the quiz is going to cover material from um, 5.3 to 6.1. Um, I'll update that on the website. And, uh, and there will be also a homework. I'm going to open the available probably tomorrow. Uh, and uh, you can, you, again, you have one week to work on it. Um, for those of you who did the home, write the quizzes tomorrow. Um, um, for those of you who did the homework, um, I'm not sure if you finish it, but if you finish the homework already, um, can you tell me a little bit about the homework, what the length, the amount of work, okay? I, um, I had 25 problems. Uh, to me, it seems to be a, a I just want to give you more practice. Okay, so halfway, take about one and a half hours. It wasn't too bad. Okay, that's good. The amount seems to be okay. All right. Um, all right, good. Um, so, okay, so Julie has a, a problem. Um, so, okay. All right, good to know. So it sounds like the, the amount of work required is reasonable. Um, I'll definitely keep that in mind. And that, you know, if in the future there's time that um, I give you an assignment that end up taking a lot more time, just feel free to let me know, but hopefully that wouldn't happen. Um, oh, good to know. Um, good. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to come see me during office hours. Um, again, the maximum is available. Feel free to um, go get help from them um, because we probably don't have time to go over every question. Right? So for today, I'm, my plan is to go through one problem um, you may or may, may or may not have question with, but just in general, there's a lot of places you can get help from. Um, and, and I also, um, you know, if you know someone in the class, feel free to talk to each other about homework questions, but don't copy the answers from them. You know, if you just copy the final answer from your friends from the class, you're not benefiting from it, right? But it's okay to, you know, chat with them, say, hey, you know, I have this question and how did you approach it? Something like that, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, yes, the quiz will be during class. So my plan is that, uh, we're going to go over some mater new material at the beginning. And uh, then I'm going to give you half an hour to work on the quiz. Uh, if you have questions before the quiz, we can spend a little bit of time review for it. Um, and then, so you got half an hour to actually to work on the quiz. Um, and after that, I'm going to give you another 10 minutes. So extra 10 minutes for you to scan your work and upload your work as a PDF file um, onto Canvas page. So in total, you have 40 minutes for the quiz. The question says bacteria population starts with 300 and the growth at a rate. So R of T is the rate, the growth rate of bacteria, uh, which is this function, and then per hour. And it says, how many bacteria will there be after three hours? So we need to know the total amount of bacteria after three hours. Okay. Um, All right, I see. I'll mention that that velocity and the distance, um, velocity and distance question um, after this, okay? Uh, so for this question, we're going to assume that we're looking for the total bacteria. We're going to assume that when it begins, that's t equals zero, and then we want to know the total amount of bacteria at t equals three. Right, so that's something we learned in 5.4. So section 5.4, 
there's a theorem says the net change is equal to the integral of rate of change. So if we have rate of change in time, we're just gonna call it integral of rate of change from A to B. So this integral here gives us a net change from T equals A to T equals B. So every time you integrate the rate of change function, right, whatever the rate of change, the rate of change of population or the rate of change of fluid flowing, um, if you integrate that function from a lower bound to an upper bound, you get a net change, the, the change in the total amount from those two times. So that's what that theorem says. So from here, we know the rate of change function. So given R of T is the rate of change function. So that's a 450.267 E to the 1.12567 T. So that's the rate of change function. So if we want to know the total bacteria after three hours, we have to know how much has increased, right? What's the net increment in terms of the, the amount of bacteria in that three hours? So the first thing we need to know is we need to find the net change in population in three hours. So that's given by integrating from zero to three of that rate of population, which is 450.267 e to the 1.12567 t dt. So that will give us a, the net change in popu sorry, population. Right? And the, to integrate this, we can pull out the constant first, just move it outside. So that's a 450.267 integrating from zero to three of e to the 1.12567 t dt. And uh, we just need to focus on the integral part, the constant, we don't have to worry about it. How do we integrate this? Now, there's a couple of ways to integrate this function. The easiest way that we can do is that we can just use u substitution. That's probably the easiest. I wasn't thinking about it that yesterday during office hour. But if we call this u, so we're going to let u equals 1.12567 t, and then you can use the substitution du, and then rewrite the integral in terms of u and a du. And dt equals 1 over 1.12567 du. Substitute into just the integral. This integral will become integrating 0 to 3. But remember, those are the t values, not u. And then e to the u, and then times 1 over 1.12567 du. Now you can move this constant in front of the integral, multiply it with 450.267. So this integral will become this expression, not just the integral, this expression will become 450.267 divide by, let me rewrite this, 450.267 divide by 1.12567 integrating t from zero to t equals three, e to the u du, and I'm pretty confident that you know how to integrate e to the u du. Um, I have uh, a question on this one. Mm -hmm. So I did, I think I did it a little bit differently. Uh, I, still got the, I still got a correct answer. So what I did is I took the derivative or took the integral of the whole thing. Uh -huh. And then at the very end, I added um, the starting value, which for me was 450. But in this case, it would have been 300. And I still got the same answer. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the total population at the end? Yeah. 
Okay. So like I essentially took the the integral of the entire thing, got yeah. a number, and then added that number to the starting value. Two three hundred exactly. Yeah. So I haven't got to that point yet. You're right. Um, so here I'm not going to finish. I'm going to let you finish there. So after you do that, you should end up with a number. That number is a net change in population, right? But we're looking for the total population. So the total population, like Sam said, total population is equal to the initial, the starting population plus the change, the amount that increased So you're gonna to have to take whatever you, the, num, the net population you calculated, you have to add the initial population to it, which is 300. So take this number added there. That will give you the correct total population. Any questions on that? Um, right, so Sam had a good point for that. So you, for the, the velocity distance um, question, so let me give myself some space to write the notes. So the, the, the question about velocity distance. So obviously the first part, I'm sure you all comfortable with just integrating, finding the velocity, but for the distance to find the distance, what you have to do is that after you find the velocity, you know, you have some velocity function, don't just integrate directly because if you just integrate, I think it was from zero to four or something like that, if you integrate zero to four of velocity function dt, this doesn't give you distance, this gives you displacement, which is a net change in position, right? So, so that doesn't give you the distance, but to find distance there, what you have to do, you have to think about in this case, the particle or the object is moving in perhaps starting here is moving in one direction and then at some point it's gonna turn around moving in the other direction. So the, the, the displacement only give you this part. This is what we call a displacement, but that's not the distance we're looking for. To find the distance, we have to calculate from here to the point that it tends around in, and travel in the opposite direction. So you need to find this distance Let's call it distance one. And then, then you have to calculate the distance in the opposite direction. You can call this distance two. And then you have to add together the magnitude to get the total distance. So the, 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 the extra step you have to do here, you have to figure out when does this happen? The moment that it, it goes in one direction and it turns around travel in the opposite direction. You need to figure out that moment which is the velocity equals zero. So we went through one example like this in, in um, I think it was in the, again, the section um, 5.4. Take a look at that section and try it. Let me know if you have more questions. So total distance is equal to distance one plus distance two. Any other questions? All right, so if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna move on to the material that I want to work on today. So last time we were talking about finding the area between curves. 
and uh, there was two ways to find the area. So area between oops, depends on how we draw the rectangle, right? So if we say um, if we have Let's see one function here and a second function here. And then we want to know this area between them. If we draw the rectangle vertically, then the, 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 the base of the rectangle, this will be delta x. And the, the height of the rectangle will be the difference of the two function. Let's just call this um, f up function or high function. This is a F low function. So the, the area will be given by integrating from A to B, let's call that B, of the, the we're going to sum up all the area of those rectangles, which is given by the height of the rectangle times the base. The height is the difference of the two y values, the two functions. So there'll be f high function minus f low function times the base, which is delta x. In this case, we're going to use dx. Right? The height times the base, you integrate it to get all the rectangles together. So that's one way. But if you draw the rectangle horizontally, let's say you have a curve that looks like this and a second curve like like this and let's call this is c this is a d and the rectangle are horizontal in this case for each rectangle there the height of the rectangle will be just the dy delta y the changing y but the the base the horizontal distance the base of the rectangle so that will be given by this function on the left, when we call it FL, this function on the right, F right. So that the, the length, the, the length, the base of the rectangle will just be FR, the right function minus the left function. And then we integrate it from C to D with respect to Y, DY. That's the area. But keep in mind that because we integrate with respect to y, so this has to be a function of y. The, the left function also should be a function of y. So those should be functions in terms of y, not in terms of x. So that's something to keep in mind. And the c and the d are y values that you're integrating. So those are also y values. But if we use vertical rectangles, we integrate with, with um, respect to x. So those are the functions of x. And the a and the b are x values. So just keep consistent on those. Um, with that said, said um, I want to begin with this example. So here we have, uh, I have three functions given, y equals square root of x, this, this line in black. And then y equals x minus two is this orange line. And the y equals zero, the blue line. So I want to find the area bounded between all three curves. So that's this area that I'm looking for. And I'm gonna find the area using two methods. I'm going to use the vertical rectangle method and then we're going to use the horizontal rectangle method. So let's talk about the vertical rectangle method. You have to be a little bit careful because here there's the region is shaded, is, um, is bounded by three functions, right? So if we just see, if we just draw a rectangle, it depends on where we draw it for the rectangle, the, 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 the higher function and the low function, they might be different. So if I draw it like uh, to the left side of two, so the, the, blue, the black is a high function, the blue is a lower function. But if I draw it a little bit to the right, then the lower function will be different, right? So here you have to be careful when you find the total area, you have to 
find the different the area of different sections, add them together. So here we need to kind of take the 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 area we want and just divide it in the middle where the the blue and the red line intersect at x equals two. So we're going to find the area on the left first, and then find area on the right. So here the area is equal to. Let's just focus on the area on the left. I'm going to integrate for the area on the left because I use a vertical rectangle. I know that the base of the rectangle is delta x. And the height of the rectangle is given by the black line and the blue line. So this is a, this is a function high, this is a function low, the blue one. So the area is going from zero to two. Anywhere between there, the black is always a higher function, the blue is always a lower function. So the height of the rectangle is given by the difference of them. So that's a square root of x minus the lower function, which is just a zero. That's a height of the rectangle. And at the base of the rectangle, which is dx, so that's a, the, the left half of the area. Then I'm going to add the other half of the area. The other half of the area, again, I have the base of the rectangle is just delta x. But the height of the rectangle is given by the difference between the black line, black curve, and also the red, the orange one. So that's the height of the rectangle. So I'm integrating this region is from two to four. And then the higher function is square root of x again, but the lower function is x minus two, so minus x minus two. And the base is dx. Again, this is the, the height of rectangle, this is the base of rectangle, again, same thing, height of rectangle, base of rectangle. It's um, when you work on a problem like this, it's always good to draw a diagram. Uh, why are we doing multiple rectangles? Um, that's why, that's, um, so why do we use multiple rectangles? Oh, hold on, why was that the first one minus zero? Because the first one, the height of the rectangle is bounded between the, the, the black curve, the square root of x function, and also the y equals zero function, the, the x axis. So that's why we have a minus zero. So that the square root of x minus zero shows a difference, the height of the rectangle. Yeah, so, so this region is bounded by three curves, not just two, right? Um, so you have to be a little bit careful. Um, and why, why are we doing multiple rectangles? Um, because it depends on which region we are in, the rectangle have different upper bound and lower bound. Like the, on the left side of two, of x equals two. In this region, the, in this region, the, the rectangle, the, the, the lower bound of the rectangle is the blue line, the upper bound is the black one. But when you pass two, x equals two, the lower bound of the rectangle becomes the orange line, the upper bound is still the black, black line. So you have to use different, um, you have to use rectangles in different regions to, to figure out the lower and the upper bound. Um, how do we know where to use that root x? Again, that's why you always want to have a picture, have a diagram and a, draw a rectangle in that region and then use the, the top of the rectangle and the bottom of the rectangle to figure out which function to use. So by looking at both rectangles, the top of the rectangle always touch the black curve square root of x. So I always have to use square root of x in, in each part when I find the area. How do you know at that point that it's square root of x though? Oh, that point right. square root of x, it just, I'm, I'm using this function square root of x. Um, that point, it depends on oh, what, okay. 
value is. So that that y value is always given by square root of the corresponding x value. Since there are two intersections with three curves, generally speaking, yes. Um, because if you imagine, you know, you draw a lot of rectangles, right? In the yellow shaded part, the rectangle always have the same function for the higher function, the same function for the lower function. But as soon as that rectangle is to the right side of two, the, the lower function has changed. It's not the same. The lower function is not the same as the rectangle to the left side of two. So that's why you have to take the total area and then divide it into multiple parts and then focus on each part. And here. All right. So let me quickly do one more step. I'm probably not going to solve this completely. So the next step, just integrating to integrate, you want to write everything in terms of um, roots. I mean, exponential function. So that's integrating from zero to two, x to the half dx, just drop the negative zero, minus zero, and the plus from two to four, x to the half minus x plus two dx. Integrating each part, if we plug in numbers, so the first integral will give us, um, when we add, so here we have to add one divided by the new exponent, so x to the one half plus one, three half, and then we have to divide by that. For this first integral, we evaluate from zero to two and the plug in the antiderivative of the second one. So that's a uh, uh, one over three half x to the three half minus x squared one half plus two x. We're gonna evaluate this expression from two to four. And I'm not going to do the work because the rest is about plugging numbers and to find the difference, right? So the rest is just um, two over three, two to the three half minus plugging zero, you get zero. So that's coming from the first part. And then you do the same thing with the second part. Take four put in there. So two over three, four to the three half minus one half times four squared plus two times four. And then you have to subtract the terms you get when you plug in two. So minus um, two over three, two to the three half minus one half, two squared plus two times two. And that's a big bracket. I don't have a calculator and I'm not interested in the final answer to this. Um, any questions about that? the setup there? So whenever you look at a bounded region, um, if you cannot, you know, when you draw the rectangles, if the, the, the upper bound or the lower bound changes, then you need to divide it into multiple sections. I just have one last question on that one. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I'm just a little bit confused on like, how do you tell between like the sections? It just all, it's all set to Y equals something. So like, ah. like the, I understand that we're using root X as the height, but like those all are just Y equals something. Like why wouldn't I use Y equals X minus two as the height instead? Um, well, you wouldn't because if you plot this graph on your own, you will know that the black curve I had earlier, that graph, that's uh, the function y equals square root of x. And the y, the, if you plot the line y equals x minus two, you will know that corresponding to this line. Oh, if you literally put that in Desmos, I'm with you. Say it again? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I just plot all of them together without labeling them and I just, you know, um, label them quickly at the beginning.
if you plot them one at a time, then you will know which curve is which one. Uh, all right. So again, I'm, the next part, I'm going to use a horizontal rectangle method. So same diagram. We haven't changed the, the, the boundaries yet. So in the horizontal rectangle method, we're going to integrate with respect to y. So here, the, the, this curve is still y equals square root of x. And the red one is y equals x minus 2. And then we have this blue line, which is um, y equals 0. And this, again, same area we're looking for. But here, we're going to draw rectangles horizontally. For each rectangle we draw there, if you kind of, let me just draw a few to show you. If we draw the rectangle here, the left bound of the rectangle is a black curve. The right bound is a red one. If I draw the rectangle a little bit higher, it's the same thing, right? If I draw the rectangle a little bit higher, like further up, again, the left bound of the rectangle is still the black curve. The right bound of the rectangle is still the, the red one. So no matter where you draw the rectangle in this case, the left bound is always square root of x function. The right bound is always the x minus 2 function when you draw horizontal rectangles. Right? So, so here we just use one integral. We don't need multiple integrals. And uh, for each rectangle, the, the, base, the height of the rectangle, this part is delta y. But then the, the, the base of the rectangle is given by the difference of the right function minus the left function. So when we integrate, you find the area. I'm going to write down the boundaries later. So the right function is the one in red. So this function is y equals x minus 2 minus the left function, which is given by y equals square root of x. The reason I have, I'm not putting in the parentheses yet because I don't want to put x minus 2 in there. And then dy, which is the height of the, rec, of the rectangle. So now let's put in those functions. Remember I said earlier, when you integrate with respect to y, the functions you use has to be functions of y. So for this first function, we have to find out the function in terms of y. So what we're going to do is we're just going to solve for x from there. So we're going to add 2 to both sides. So we get x equals y plus 2. So that's what we're going to use in there. So y plus 2. Same thing for the other side. We're going to solve for x. So we're going to square both sides. So we get x equals y squared. So we're going to put y squared in there. In terms of square root of x, we're going to use y squared. Those are the those the y plus two coming from y equals x minus two when we solve for x. The y squared coming from y equals square root of x when we solve for x. So we're going to use those two functions because they're in terms of y. Now we also need to know the lower bound and the upper bound when we integrate with respect respect to y. From the diagram, you can see we the region that we're looking for goes from y equals 0 to the highest point of y, which is y equals 2. Right? If you kind of look at the rectangle, when you stack up the rectangles, it goes all the way to y equals 2. So the boundaries of y value is from 0 to 2. So that's the integral setup for the area using horizontal rectangles. And then the next step is just integrating, finding the antiderivative, and find the value. So this is equal to um, integrate antiderivative of y, which is y squared one half, plus antiderivative of two, which is two y, minus the antiderivative of y squared, which is y cubed one third. And then we're going to evaluate this expression from zero to two you should be able to end up with a value.
And uh, that value, if you do it correctly, is the same thing as the, the value we get in the previous step using two sections to find the total area. Because the area is the same, it just depends on how we integrate to find the total area. So if you saw this problem on the assessment, which, ah, Brian, that's a good question. Um, if I see it, just based on the experience I have, I am gonna use the, the integrate, the horizontal rectangle because it's just one area, right? Just one integral. Um, for you, if you don't have that experience, it's really up to you, both approach works. There's no um, right or wrong um, approach. So either one is fine. Um, I'll let you decide. It really depends. Sometimes um, it's much more complicated if you want to use one way. For example, if I have this example, um, let's see. Um, if I give you, let's just see, this is a, uh, let me just use this one. This is a y equals x squared. Let's see, I want to integrate this function y equals, uh, if I want to find the area between this function and uh, let's, let me see, um, y equals x plus one, I think it's this one. Let's see the line is y equals x plus one. Let's suppose I want to find this area between them, right? Suppose that we know those intersections, um, it's not difficult to find them, and I want to know this area. If you have this setup, um, if you have this setup, you're gonna have to use vertical rectangle to make it easy. Because the vertical rectangle, everywhere, everywhere you draw the rectangle, the, the upper bound is always the straight line, the lower bound is always the, the parabola, right? So that's the easiest way. But if you say, oh, what if I try to use a horizontal rectangle? Well, if you try to use a horizontal rectangle here, you're gonna run into a little bit problem because in this part, it's perfectly fine to draw the horizontal rectangle. You know, the left, Bound, left side, left bound is a line, the right bound is a parabola. But once you pass below this line, this then the, the, the left side and the right side of the rectangle, they are really the same function, y equals x squared. You're gonna have a little bit problem there because you can't just use the same function that you have to figure out the right bound of this section, the green part, in terms of, of, as a function of y, so that's a x equals square root of y, but then the right side of this section, this part, I mean, sorry, the left side, the blue part, that is actually um, x equals negative square root of y. So you have to figure out those two functions in order to use horizontal rectangle method. So it's a little bit more, a little bit more work, if you want to use horizontal rectangle method, it's a, a lot easier if you just use vertical rectangle method. Um, generally, problem like this, you know, you're gonna know pretty quickly that, you know, if you try one approach, it doesn't, you know, doesn't give you a, a quick way to find the answer. Just switch to the other rec, the other, um, the other method, and then that will that should um, clarify things. Um, are there going to be questions where we have to integrate a problem like this using a specific method? That might be. Um, that might be questions that, you know, I would be like, oh, you have to use um, horizontal rectangle method or integrate with respect to x, something like that. Um, but generally speaking, I, I don't know if I want to be that specific. Um, if not, if I'm specifically saying, oh, using this method, that means it's the easiest method I'm asking you to do. I'm not going to, um, you know, ask you to do it in a more challenging way. All right. So any other questions?
All right, if you don't have questions on this, I'm gonna move on to the next section, which is about finding volumes of solids. Um, so what we did earlier is finding the area between curves, right? So the, the regions have, bound, have functions as boundaries, we can find the area, but now we can find volumes of solids. Um, this is very useful because, you know, a lot of times you want to find the volume of um, complicated shapes. So the basic definition of volume, you all know. So a volume in geometry, so volume V is equal to base area times height, right? Just simple. You all know that. Um, but if you have a, a, um, a more complicated shapes, when you want to use um, calculus to find it, it's a similar idea. So what we do is that we look at a section, a section of the volume of the solid that you want. You look at it, and then you can find the, the cross-sectional area. We're going to call it A. So the, in this case, the diagram on the left, the shaded, the purple part. So this purple part has the area, let's call it A of X. Let's call this is just some X value. And then we can take that cross section. We can see, okay, that section has a thickness delta X. So this is a delta X. And if we take the, the, the thickness delta X, multiply with the, the area, the cross sectional area, A of X, that will give us a volume of one slice of that volume, right? So that's kind of like a slice of bread, if you think about it. So that's the, the volume of one slice. But if we take that slice, if we assume that there's a lot of slices, like the diagram, diagram on the right, so if we add up all those slices, then we end up with the total volume, right? So I from one to N, suppose we have N slices, so we can add up all of them together. Then we take the limit as N goes to infinity. We actually end up with the exact volume for the shape. In, um, in terms of integral notation, so the volume or just equal to you integrating, let's say the the left bound is A, the right bound is B from left to right. If we're integrating all the volumes of each slice, each slice is given by the, the base area, which is a cross-sectional area, A of X. And then the thickness of the slice is DX. And then that gives us the volume. So keep in mind that the A of X, it just means the, the area of the cross-section. The D of X is the thickness. So cross sectional area and a D of X is the thickness of each slice. So that's, that's gonna give us a volume. So just always keep this in mind before we, um, I'm, I'm going to use a, a few examples to, to show you how this works. Um, but keep in mind that volume is given by um, the, the area of each section times the, the thickness of each section. And then you integrate that. Basically, means you're summing up all those small volumes to get the total volume. So here's a question. Um, so here I have. So it says we're going to find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals square root of x, y equals zero, x equals two about x axis. So that's a lot of information going on. Let me just kind of break it down. So this region, the shaded part, has the, the red curve, which is y equals square root of x. And then the, the, the x, the y equals zero, is just this bottom part of that shaded region. This is y equals zero. And then this right side of that shaded region is x equals two. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna rotate this shape about the x-axis, just rotate it 360 degrees. So 
So I'm going to try to draw this. Um, so if you if you imagine, you know, you take a if let's just see anything you take, right? If you take this, I don't know if you can see it. If you take a piece of paper, you rotate it 360 degrees. The the volume that covered by the paper is a cylinder, right? So here we sort of end up with like a cone shape. So the shape we get when we rotate this piece 360 degrees, we sort of end up with this shape. It's a, you have to imagine this is like a, it's sort of like a, a cone shape. It's actually a solid when you rotate it. Um, I'm gonna have to trust that you can like try to picture, picture that in your head. It's a, it's a 3D shape after we rotate that around the x-axis 360 degrees. So it's sort of like an ice cream um, cone there, basically. So we're looking for that volume. Well, to find the volume, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, just like I did earlier with a diagram by picking one slice. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to pick a slice, this slice, and I'm going to assuming that the thickness of the slice is so small so that's like a one small slice in the middle there let's call this is the x so the volume formula says we're going to integrate from a to b of the cross-sectional area in this case, the thickness is just delta x, right? If you imagine, you know, one piece is here, one piece is here, so the change between them is a horizontal change. So that's dx in this case. I'm going to use delta dx here. And how do we find the cross-sectional area? Well, if we rotate it 360 degrees, we just end up with a circle, right? If you try to picture the cross-section, so cross section i'm going to draw the diagram here it's really just a circle there this, this is like imagine this is the x-axis goes through it right in the middle there but that piece is actually vertical so the cross section is a circle that means we can find the area of that circle using the area formula for circles so area a of x is equal to pi r squared Right, that's the area. But what is the radius? The radius, if you look at it the, from the diagram on the left, the radius is given from the distance of the x-axis to the curve y equals square root of x. That's the radius, the one I'm labeling in blue. Ah, um, uh, it's right. So, so Daniel is right. So the radius is a y, right? But because it depends on where you pick the slice, the radius is different. So if I pick the slice here, the radius is close to one. But if I pick it a little bit close to the origin, the radius is actually a lot smaller than one. So the radius is actually given by the y value, not just two. Two is at the very end. At the very end, the radius actually is not two. It's less than two. Um, so the radius here, we're just going to use a function because it's a difference between y equals square root of x and then the, the x equals zero. I mean, the y equals zero. So the radius is just going to be square root of x minus zero here. That's what the radius is. So the area becomes pi times the radius squared. That's a cross-sectional area. I'm going to put this in the integral. So we get volume is equal to integrating. I'm going to find a and the b later. The, the a is just pi then the radius. The radius is the difference between the, the square root of x function and the zero. So I'm just going to write square root of x squared dx. So this part is a cross-sectional er cross sectional area, kind of like the base area of a volume. Um, same um, pi r squared. Um, 
Yes, in the sense that if we always rotate a piece 360 degrees around um, around the x-axis, like in this setup, it is um, just pi r squared. If it's a different setup, it's um, it's 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 basically it's a it's it is still pi r squared. It's a little bit different. It's a, it's a it's a variation of pi r squared, slightly different. Um, that's the thickness. And uh, let me find the the. So why is it that? Because because when we rotate something three hundred sixty degrees about an x x about any axis, we always end up with this like a like a rounded shape. It's like a circular, sh like each slice, if you cut it in the middle, each cross section is always going to be circular. It's going to be a circle. So that's why it's always pi r squared. All right, how did I get that? Uh... <laughs> um. So what it told us to, so whenever it says the volume of solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by this, that means we're gonna rotate it 360 degrees. That's just a, that's just a term. Um, and next time, you know, when you see that phrase, you can assume that we take that region, the area we're gonna rotate it 360 degrees about a given axis to make a volume. Um, how do I end up with the radius? So the radius is given by, so if you look at the cross section on the left side, the radius is given by the, the distance from the, from the, the, the y equals square root of x function to the x-axis. So that difference, that's the radius of rotation. Um, You have to rotate it 100, you have to rotate it 360 degrees in order to have a, um, a three dimensional closed shape. Th this is not going to be on the quiz tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I recommend that, you know, take a piece of paper um, later and then just rotate it around your pencil, see if you end up with that shape. So anyway, the boundaries. So since we're integrating with respect to x, we need to know the x boundaries, right? So for the re for the shaded region, we begin with the x boundary is going from zero to x equals two. So the boundaries are from zero to two. And then you can finish this later. So just let me write down one more step. So that's a, from zero to two pi, you can move it in front and then square root of x squared, that just give you x, dx. So if you integrate that, you can figure out the volume. I'm not gonna do that step because um, I hope that at this point you're comfortable with doing that. Shall we move on? All right, let me try with another problem here. So here's a question. So it says find the volume of a sphere with radius r. So assuming that some sphere there has a radius r, and then we're gonna assume that the volume is obtained by rotating the up and the, the up half of a circle with radius r. So, so assuming that this circle has a radius r here, centered at the origin so this is r and then we're only going to take half up half of the circle so we're going to take the semicircle and then we're going to rotate that semicircle about the x-axis i didn't see that uh rotating the up half um about x-axis i miss that miss out that part so if we take this region, we, sh we rotate it about the x-axis, 360 degrees. So we get this sphere, 
uh, the sphere here. Right, if you imagine that, that half a circle, you rotate it around the, the, the x-axis, you should be able to get a uh, sphere out of it. I'm not drawing it very well, but try to do the, try to picture that in your head. So let's find the volume. So that, so that sphere, the volume of that sphere is what we want. So volume is equal to integral from A to B of cross-sectional area, A of X, DX, in this setup. So let's look at one intersection, one cross-section there. So I'm going to take this one on the left. Doesn't matter which one you pick, you, I'm going to pick this one. I'm going to erase this line just getting crowded there. So for this cross section, again, the cross section when you rotate it around the x axis, that's going to be a that's going to be a circle, a circular disk. So this cross section, if you draw it out, it's going to look like this with some height, some thickness. I don't know if I'm drawing it correct, but you use your imagination, right? So that's a cross section. And then the, the thickness of that cross section here, the thickness, it's just going to be delta x. And the, if we want to know the area of this, Again, that's a circle, so we can use the area formula for circle. So area equals pi r squared. But what is the radius in this case? We have to find out, right? So that's some radius function. Well, the radius will be given by, again, I'm going to use the blue color here. It will be given by the, the distance from the red curve to the x-axis. So that's a radius. But what is the function for this red curve? Well, if you don't know that, here's how you find the, the function for the red curve. You know that circles, so recall, circle has equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Then we can solve for y from there. So y squared equals r squared minus x squared. So y equals plus minus square root of r squared minus x squared. But for the red curve, if you are familiar with this red curve has a function, just a positive y, right? Everywhere the y value is positive. So this is the y equals square root of r squared minus x squared. The lower half we didn't use, that one has y equals negative square root of r squared minus x squared, but we're not using it. So we don't need to write down the function for that lower half. So what is the area for each cross-sectional, uh, for each cross-section? So that's just pi r squared with the radius being square root r squared minus x squared. So that's the radius for each cross-section. So go back to the volume function. So the volume equals integrating from a left bound to the right bound. I'm going to put that in there later. That's a pi square root r squared minus x squared squared. It should be like minus zero, but I'm not writing minus zero there. dx. And the left bound, and the, the right bound, the boundaries of the integral, we have to look at it from the shaded region. Because it's a circle centered at the, at the origin, so this value on the left is minus r. The value on the right, it's a positive r. It's a, it's a r distance to the left and to the right side of the origin. So that's a minus r to positive r. Any, does this setup kind of make sense? Okay. Um, so the next step is just, you know, just like we do, we integrate, treat R as a constant, the radius R, capital R is a constant. So that's going from negative R to, to, 
to positive r. Pi, I'm going to bring pi outside. The r squared minus x squared coming from the, um, so that's, that's, that, that's, uh, um, I got that part by finding the function for the, for the orange curve, which is uh, the equation for the circle, right? If you remember that in geometry, right? Equation for the circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r being the radius. So what I did is I took that equation and I solved for y, which gave me y equals plus minus square root of r square minus x square. And the, from there, I know that the shaded region always have a positive y because it's above the x-axis. So the function for that, for that um, orange curve, is always gonna be y equals square root of r square minus x square. And then that curve, to x-axis, the distance between them, that's the radius for the, for the cross-sectional area. Then I put in that cross-sectional area equation, which is pi r squared. And I put, uh, put in the radius there for, the, for each, for the cross-section. And uh, then I put in the integral for the volume. Um, that's why that's why I have a r square minus x square. So if I rewrite that, I squared that square root. So we get r square minus x squared dx. And if I continue, so that's a pi. Find the antiderivative, which is r square x. You have to treat r as a constant. And then the minus x cubed one third, and evaluating this from negative r to positive r. And then you just be careful when you plug in r there. So if you put in r there, you got r cubed minus one third r cubed. And then minus negative r. So if you put in there, you get negative r cubed minus one third of negative r cubed. And uh, if you do everything correctly, inside you should get r cubed minus one third r cubed plus r cubed. And then you have minus minus become a positive, and then you have a minus and minus one third r cubed. At the end, you get four over three pi r cubed. That's a, um, that's a formula that if you remember, I don't know if you learned it in the past or not, if you look it up, the volume for a volume formula for a sphere, it's always gonna be forces pi r cubed. That's where the formula come from, you know, in generally speaking. I just wanna use this example to show you that you know, a formula you memorize in geometry, um, you can find it here by um, using calculus or at least confirm it with calculus. You, you can do this, do a lot with this, you know, you can use calculus to find out the volume of a pyramid, all that kind of stuff. What is the fine? That's fine for the final answer, exactly. Yeah, so we cannot simplify further because we don't know what the radius is. It just R here. Um, which part is confusing? Same. <laughs> um, so so the, I, I want to use this example. So the idea is that, um, so, so the first thing you kind of have to picture, right? You're rotating a, 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 a two-dimensional region. You rotate it around the x-axis to get a um, three-dimensional shape. That's what you kind of have to picture in your head. And then you just take a cross, like a t kind of like use a knife to cut it in the middle to get a cross-section out of it. And then from the cross-section, you can find out the area of it and then use the thickness. 
So this is the area of the cross section. This is the thickness of that section. You integrate it to get the volume. Um, and you just be careful, you know, to find the, the cross sectional area we're going to use because it's a circle. So we're going to use um, pi r squared. You have to find out the radius by using the, the up bound of that radius, you know, where the highs of the radius and then the lower part of that. Um, let me try with another example. Hopefully it clarifies a bit. Um, if it not, I hope it doesn't confuse you more, but uh, actually it might confuse you a little bit more, but let me try it with another example. So the next example I have is um, in this case, we're going to take this region. So this region is bounded between y equals square root of x x equals zero, which is a y-axis. So this is x equals zero. And also the line y equals square root of two. So we're gonna take this region, we're gonna rotate it around the y-axis now. So rotate it around y-axis. So if we do that, we end up with this, this uh, let me draw this. So we end up with this sort of like a cone shaped. You kind of have to picture this kind of like, a, a, you know, some kind of a glassware. Um, when you rotate that piece around the Y axis. And in this case, you have to be a little bit careful because, because we rotate it around y-axis, if we cut it into slices, thus each slice is not gonna be a vertical slice. Like the disc is not gonna be like this, it's gonna be horizontal. So if we cut it into slices, this is what one cross section look like. It's a horizontal circular disc. Right? So it's a little bit different. It's not a vertical circular disc, it's a horizontal. So if we take all those pieces, we stack them together from bottom to the top, we get this overall shape. So for this disc here, the thickness is delta y is not delta x anymore. And the, we can still find the cross-sectional area because it's a circular disc. I feel like I'm drawing a lot here. Um, difficult to see, perhaps. Um, so this cross, so the cross section is still a circle. So if you look from the top, you get a circle. So for each circular disk, you can find the volume. So for each disk, you can find the volume is equal to the thickness delta y times the area of that disk, which is pi times some radius squared. But what is the radius in this case? The radius is not given by the function on the top. It's actually given by this part. This is the radius. Because if you rotate that around the y-axis, you get a circle. Get a circle. That's kind of like that's a that's a flat. Um, I'm not drawing well, but I hope you can try to picture this. So, so the radius is given by the blue segment. And how do we find this, this, this radius? And that radius R here is equal to the distance between the function, the, the, the orange curve to the y-axis. So that's the x value. So this part, that's the radius, this is the x value.
So in this case, we're not using a vertical disc that slice, each of the slice we're using, they're horizontal, so they're flat, right? So that thickness of each slice there, that's a delta Y, it's not, it's not a vertical. So earlier we had a vertical slice. So if you think about, you know, when you slice something vertically, the difference between them, that's change in the X direction, right? Delta X. But here we're not doing that. We're doing the opposite, the other way. We're doing the slices horizontally. So that's each of that is a horizontal slice. So the, 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 the thickness of the each slice is a change in the Y direction. So that's a delta Y here. Exactly. So Aiden, that's right. So it, it depends on which axis you rotate around. If it rotates around the x-axis, the change the 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 change will be the that will be delta x as a thickness. If you rotate around the y-axis, um, will be delta y. So let's. So the radius is given by x, but the x, we don't know. We know y equals square root of x. So we can solve for x there. So since y equals square root of x, we can solve for x. x equals y squared. So that's what the radius is, y squared. That's the extra step you have to do there. So the volume of the shape, we're integrating from a lower bound to the upper bound, so that's from A to B, area, but the area here is not in terms of X, it's area in terms of Y, dy. Just like when we had a, a of X, dx, here, here we have A of Y, dy. So that's going from, I'm gonna figure out the, the bounds, the lower and the upper bound later, so the area in the Y of the cross section, which is a pi, radius squared, the radius is y squared, so pi r squared, and then dy, the lower bound is from zero. If you look at the cross section, the lower bound is from y equals zero, the upper bound is square root of two, zero to square root of two. I figure that it's probably more confusing to some of you. Um, so let me stop there. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to kind of process this, um, this problem. So try to picture that cross section in your head. In this, part, in this case, it's a, it's a horizontal cross section. So you have to figure out the area of that horizontal cross section. Again, it's a circular shape, so it's pi r squared. But the radius, you have to find it by using the function on the right minus the y-axis, so that's a square root of x. That's y equals square root of x. That's a function on the right, minus the the y-axis. So if you if you do the do the so the a y is pi y square squared because the radius, the one that I labeled in blue here, that radius you have to use this orange curve, which is square root of x, but you have to figure out what the x is from there. So if you take the square, y equals square root of x, you solve for x, so you get x equals y squared. That's what this orange curve is. And then the radius, the one I labeled in blue, will just be the, the x value. So it will be y squared minus zero. So that's what the radius is. Uh, yes, because it's changing, right? So, so it depends on where you pick that cross section. The the radius is not going to be the same, but the radius in this diagram is always going to be bounded between the the orange curve and then the y-axis. So, this is always going to be the radius. It's always going to be bounded between those two curves, even though it's changing. 
Uh, why pick the R there? It doesn't make sense. Well, if you look at the cross section, right? If, if you look from the top of the shape, uh, if you look from the top, look down on, on that disc, that disc, it's a circular disc there. Right? If you look from the top, oops, I'm not draw that. And that circular disc, this is this is a y-axis, and the, this is the radius. And that's the what the blue line I have, the blue segment in the drawing. So that's the radius. And that radius is the diff the distance, the horizontal distance between the y-axis and then the orange function. That's what that radius is. Um, so i is not the midpoint. So i is i is just so here I'm picking that circular disk as an example. I could pick it a little bit higher or a little bit lower. It doesn't have to be right in the middle there. But it doesn't matter where you put that circular disk is, the radius is always going to be bounded between the orange function and then the the y-axis. So whatever the difference between them, that will be the radius. So how do we get the bounds? Um, so the bound, the lower and the upper bound, because we're integrating with respect to y. So you have to go back to the shaded region, try to figure out the lower value, the lowest y value and then the highest y value. So the lowest y value is just at the origin. And then the highest y value is given by that horizontal segment which is at y equals square root of two, that's given. I'm not gonna finish solving this because um, for this problem, I think it's, you're, you're okay to integrate this and then plug in the, the two values to find the volume. So I'm just gonna stop there. So try to pick, again, the geometry is important. Try to, try to imagine, you know, like do that rotation in your head. I do imagine the 3D shape and then figure out what the slice is. All right, finish this one. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it quickly then. Uh, so that's going from zero to the square root of two. I'm gonna bring pi outside, y squared squared, so that's a y to the fourth power, dy. And then now the pi stays, I'm going to find the antiderivative of y to the fourth. So that's a, that's a y to the fifth power, right? Again, just add one, but divide by the new exponent, one fifth. And then we're going to evaluate this from zero to square root of two. When I evaluate this, I'm going to leave out the one fifth. So we get pi over five, and I'm going to just plug in number into the y to the fifth. So that's a square root of two to the fifth power minus zero to the fifth power is a zero. So I get, I don't know square root of two, square root of two to the fifth power is, doesn't matter. So I get pi over five square root of two to the fifth power. You can leave it there or you can put it in the calculator. Um, whenever you um, integrate with, with respect to y, just like you do it with x. You integrate with respect to x. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know if the next part is going to make more sense to you if you're still confused, but we do have to try more examples because there's a lot of different ways you can rotate it. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next example. Um, if you still have questions, please just stay behind um, after the lecture. I'll explain it to you. So here's number four. It's the same bounded region as number three, but we rotate it differently. So we're going to take this region. This is a y equals square y equals square root of x. How you rotate about both? Um, a good question. We don't rotate it about both axes at the same time. We we rotate about one axis to get a 3D shape. And then we don't rotate about both at the same time. We do it separately. <laughs> um, 
so you don't have to worry about rotating about both y axis and x axis at the same time. That's not going to happen. So this is x equals zero. This is y equals square root of two. So for this shape, instead of rotating around the y axis, I'm going to rotate around the x axis. So try to picture the shape as I'm drawing this. So So you should, if you kind of pictures in your head, if we do everything correctly, we get this sort of like a three dimensional shape. I don't know, does that kind of make sense, that shape? It's kind of like a mug, like on the outside is a cylinder, but inside is, uh, you know, inside is it's it's empty inside. It's kind of like a cone, like you you remove a cone shape from a cylinder. That's what the the, the solid is. I did my best to draw it, so hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. A, a bell, exactly, like a bell, but outside is a cylinder. Um, right. So we're going to find the volume of the sort of like of the wall of that mug, if you think about it's a mug. So whatever the solid part is. So let's look at this. Again, I was using this. So let me pick this cross section here. So this is a cross section. So if you take a slice, you cut in the middle, when you are rotating around axis, it's always be a circle. Uh, yes, but in this example, you will know that it's not, it, the, the solid part you see, it's actually not circle. It's sort of like a, a, a it's a washer shape. If you're familiar with washer, it's basically it's a, it's a circle, it's a circular disc, but with the middle part being removed. Uh, that will be given. So here it tells you that it's rotating around x axis uh, in the question. So we're finding the volume about rotating that shaded region about the x axis. So we're rotating around x axis 360 degrees. So I draw this disc, you know, kind of like a slice right in the middle there. And uh, because it's a vertical slice, right? So the thickness is in the x direction. So the thickness is delta x. Let's look at the cross section. So I'm going to take the cross section and put it horizontally. So the cross section, well, actually, let me just leave it the way it is. So the cross section looks like this. That's what the cross section is. And this is the, this is the x axis goes through the middle. And then we, if you look at the cross section, this is the area that we need. It's not a it's not a complete circle because the middle part has a circle being removed. So it's sort of like a well, it's, it's, it's a circle with a hole in the middle, basically. Right? So this is what the cross section is. How do we find the area? Well, we can do the same thing like we did before. We can just say the area is equal to the biggest circle area minus the little circle area, right? So let's call this a big circle minus a little circle or small circle. And then the big circle, let's see, we have a radius, let's call it R1. And the little circle in the middle, we're going to call it radius r2. So that will be pi r1 squared. Let's give you the area of big circle and minus pi r2 squared. That's the area of a small circle. We can take out pi. So that's just pi r1 squared minus r2 squared. So that's the area of that cross section. 
And then if we multiply by a thickness delta x, we get a volume for that circular shape. It's what we call a washer, if you're familiar with what that means. So the volume is integral from A to B. In this case, because the, 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 the cross section is a vertical, the delta, we have delta x. So we're gonna end up with a dx. And then we're gonna have a cross section in terms of x from A to B. And I'm gonna find A and B later. So I have what? I have the, the, the cross sectional area, which is given by pi times the, 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 the large radius squared. Let's look at the large radius. So the large radius is given by the, the horizontal green line. So that's, a, that's y equals square root of two. That doesn't change. So that this line, horizontal line, that give me the large radius everywhere. So that's just square root of two minus zero squared. And then the small radius, so minus, the small radius is given by the, the orange line. I have too much drawing here, but try to picture it. So this is the small radius, the radius of the, the inner circle, which is given by square root of x, square root of x minus zero squared dx. So, so you kind of have to picture this. So the, the, the cross section you have, you have a, a, a large circle, which is kind of like, but it's, it's shaped by, you know, moving that horizontal line going around the, the shape, you get a cylinder, right? So the radius is the distance from that horizontal line, y equals square root of two to the x axis. So that's the first radius, the big one. And then the small radius of the section in the middle that we take out, that's given by the, the orange curve square root of x to the to the x-axis. So that's a small the, the, the smaller radius that we remove. And then the two boundaries we integrate for x, the two x values we integrate from, well, the most left x value is just zero, x equals zero. And then the most right value of x, we stop at x equals two. So from zero to two. So the, the left, the lower and the up bound of the integral, you always look at the cross section or the shape. Where does it go from left to right? Or is it go from a lower to high, um, to the lowest to highest point? But in this case, we're going from left to right when we integrate. And to write nicely, so that's integral from zero to two, pi, you can bring pi outside the first radius squared, so that's a square root of two squared, so that's a two, minus the, the second radius squared, so that's just x dx. And from there, you should be able to finish it on your own. How are you guys doing on this? Does it give you a headache yet? Um, I have to say though, quite a large one. <laughs> okay, um, I have to say like this is probably the, my favorite part of um, doing integration because you're actually working with shape. Um, it's 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 if I I find it for me if I can picture the shape, picture the rotation, then it becomes um become a little bit easy. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so, quick question: mm -hmm. Is the light blue that you made for this equation is that from like the left of the object, and then is the green the right? Like that's how we're integrating from. So we're subtracting the, the right from the left. Oh no, we're not subtracting the right from left. We're subtracting um. So the so the blue, I wrote. 
it's a it's a large radius for that. So oh, let me use the correct color here. So the blue is this radius. It's a larger radius of the of the. You kind of like look at the cross section. It's circle. It's circular, right? So that's the the the, the largest radius of that cross section. And then the green one is the the smaller section in the middle that so we sort of remove it. So the, the green one is the radius of the inner circle. The blue one is the radius of the outer circle. You can think it in that way too. Um, I guess I'm just confused on why the inner circle has a root x as the height. Uh, that's because um, if you go back to the diagram I have in the in the drawing in the, the, the first drawing here, so the the inner circle is given by this. Um, I'm going to use the yellow one. So this is what the inner circle looks like. It has the radius from the x-axis all the way to that orange curve, which is y equals square root of x. So this line here is y equals square root of x. So that's the inner circle. Um, right, so the, the, the y, the height is a, the square root of x. So that's a radius. And the outer circle you can think about is a purple one. So this is the, the purple one is the, is the outer circle. It has a radius, which is the blue one I draw, going all the way to that line, that blue one, and just going from zero to square root of two everywhere. So that sort of help a little bit. Um, but I know that it could be um, pretty confusing um, if you haven't seen any of this before. Let me see. Um, ah, how about this? I'm going to stop there. Um, I will stay on Zoom for a, bit, a little bit longer if you have questions, but I have a homework for you to try. Um, so here's this question number five. It's also, um, this problem is also posted on Canvas. In, the, in that um, lecture plan. So I want you to try number five on your own. So try um, your own. Um, so you can take the, the, the file I put on Canvas, took that question, you draw the shape, and then try to figure out the volume on your own. See if it, you know, try it and the, and, the, and just, just, it's good to struggle with this kind of questions for, you know, Sometime, not a bad idea. All right. So, what is plus six? So that's your homework. So you can write down the homework now, or you can just go to Canvas and look up that problem in the lecture plan um, and, uh, and to try that problem on your own and then we can talk about it. Yeah, okay, we can talk about that tomorrow. So let me finish solving this last problem. Um, but anyway, that problem is on the, you can take a quick screenshot or take a picture of it if you want. So what was the last problem? Let me go back to solve it. Um, so the last problem, we didn't finish solving it. It just pi, you find the antiderivative of two minus x. That's a two x minus x squared put divided by two. And then we're gonna evaluate this from zero to two. So leave the pi outside, plug in two first. So that's a two times two minus one half times two squared. When you minus, when you put zero in there, you get just get zero. So don't have to subtract zero. So that's a four minus one half times four, that's a two. We just get two pi.
So anyway, um, I'm going to stop here. Um, so I'll see you tomorrow. Um, definitely study for the quiz. Um, if you have any questions, bring it to, um, to the lecture tomorrow um, and then try number five on your own. That's, um, and I'll see you tomorrow. Take care, everyone. If you have questions, just stay on and I'll answer it. So is the quiz going to be mostly on like the homework related problems or is it kind of going to be a mixture of like in class and the homework? Um, it, it's going to be similar, right? Because the, 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 the examples I use in lectures are basically the same as homework questions. Um, shouldn't be that different from, um, from I set up questions. Okay. Um, just one other quick question. Is there any other like extra work, like a recitation, for example, that you expect us to do? To like know, like I know during like the normal semester we have homework and then a recitation sheet to like comprehend. Uh -huh. um, no, I don't. But um, if you you have the textbook, right? Um, so if you go to the textbook, each section they have a lot of problems, exercise questions. You can look at those. And I haven't looked in the. I think on web assign, if you uh, there's like a there's a link you can click on that will give you more practice questions. I have to dig into that. Um, but I think that's free. You can just find it on your side. But let me let me check, and I'll let you know. Okay. And um, I don't know if you already talked about it. Are the quizzes going to be like three questions, like um, in semester, or? Yeah, like about three, four questions. I think. Um, I don't think it's going to be a lot. We, you know, we give you half an hour, so we we don't put too many questions on there. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Have a great night. All right. Take care, Aiden. And we have class like before that. We still have class at six to seven thirty. Then the quiz, right? So yeah. So my plan is to have about like at least one hour class, and it depends on how many questions people have. Um, if not a lot of questions, I might talk a little bit more. But uh, if people have questions, I'm going to save enough time to to answer those review questions. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. I'm sorry, one last question before I leave. Um, yeah, the sections okay. for, uh, were 5.3 to 6.1? Yeah, so it's going to be 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, and a 6.1. Okay, thank you. Yep, all right, take care, Aiden.